Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Janelle Hazard and I am the Executive Director and Curator at Greater Reston Arts Center. Many of you have already joined us for our virtual programs that you can enjoy within the comfort of your home. Today we are delighted to bring to you a program titled Insights, where we welcome independent curator Kristen Heilman to respond to the work on view in our more drier solo exhibition, Yours for the Asking. The exhibition is on view in our in-person gallery space, but also is now available in our online viewing room where you can learn more about Maura Dreyer's early works. If you haven't checked it out, we certainly encourage you to do so. Greater Resident Arts Center presents this selection of work in conjunction with the major exhibition of Dreyer's work currently on view at the Phillips Collection in Washington, DC entitled More Dryer Back in Business. Both exhibitions are curated by Lily Siegel and serve to reposition Dryer as one of the most significant artists of her generation. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Sarah Behrens, our Education and Public Programs Manager, to introduce Kristen and tonight's program. Okay, thank you so much, Janelle. So the Insights program is designed to bring curators and other academics from major art institutions to Reston to discuss the work on view at Grace. And here we have the opportunity to bring the talk to you virtually, and we want to make sure to thank Reston Community Center for sponsoring this program. Because the program is virtual, we encourage viewers to write us at info at restonarts.org should you have any questions or comments on the talk. For past exhibitions, we have welcomed distinguished curators, including Dorothy Moss of the National Portrait Gallery, who presented on motherhood and the making for Caitlin Teal Price, Molly Donovan of the National Gallery of Art, who gave a talk on the work of Sue Werbeken, and more recently, Shannon Thomas Perrick of the National Museum of American History, who spoke about the photographer Nate Larson's work, to name a few. And today we will hear a response from curator Kristen Heilman on the work of Moira Dreyer. I'm going to introduce Kristen. Baltimore-based independent curator Kristen Heilman spent two decades working as a curator at the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC, and more recently as the head of the contemporary department at the Baltimore Museum of Art. She is currently the curator in residence at the Delaware Contemporary. Her monographic exhibitions have brought new attention to important female artists, Anne Truitt and Marin Hassinger, and she has realized major commissions with, the Mar with Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly, Sarah Oppenheimer, Thomas Sarah Seno, and others. Additionally, Heilman has organized exhibitions of the work of John Baldessari, Shai Guoshang, In Judeca Acrinelli Crosby, collaborative artists Lizzie Fitch and Ryan Trickett Parton, Maleko Mahasi and John Waters, as well as surveys of contemporary photography and time-based media. She has taught at Johns Hopkins University, George Washington University, and the Corcoran College of Art and Design, and is a frequent visiting critic and lecturer at colleges and universities. Recent projects include a retrospective exhibition of South African-born, Baltimore-based abstract painter, Joe Smale, at the Baltimore Museum of Art, which opened in March of 2020, and the debut solo museum exhibition opening in September of this year for figurative painter, Teresa Cromati, which also includes a monumental public art component uh, from June to November of this year at the Delaware Contemporary Museum. So it is our absolute privilege to hear from you, Kristen. Thank you so much for joining us and I will hand it over to you. Thank you both. Um, I really love the opportunity to be here and I am going to jump right in to some visuals. All right, very well. So we're recording this talk in the summer of 2020, a time that um, so many of us feel as historical and an opportunity for questioning change and hopefully growth. 
In this moment, I feel uh, compelled to reflect on and question the roles that art has played and will play in our culture. And that those reflections are certainly um, in my mind as we think about Moira Dreyer's work. And I'd say this context has really brought into focus the ways that the language of abstraction in Dreyer's work is uh, interlaced with the experience of living rather than removed from it. To clarify the significance of that statement, I um, am gonna spend a little time this evening talking about uh, some other 20th century American abstract artists so we can really understand why Dreyer was such an innovator. Now, before we go any further, um, there are a few things that I think it's important to know. One, as we move through this presentation, like ideally this talk was supposed to be given in the gallery, um, but because circumstances have prevented that, um, I am relying on some iPhone photography that I took, so please forgive the quality of those images. You'll, you'll certainly know them when you see them. And I also feel it's, it's important to say that I'm not a particular expert on Moira Dreyer. Um, really, before the invitation to, to speak at Grace, um, I had only really focused firsthand on two works by Dreyer. And I came to know them each separately. So this work, um, DD, from 1990, is the collection of amazing collectors here in Baltimore, Michael and Eileen Salzman. And so this is just a work that um, I have very impersonal impressions from seeing it over time on repeat visits to the Salzman's house. I've always thought of it as um, kind of a, a Jean Davis, the rigorous sort of stripes of a Jean Davis painting melting away into a blue liquidy field. Um, so that's what's going on on the top. And then on the bottom, there's this unusual slanted form that inserts itself into our space. It's almost like, um, uh, like a book stand or an altar or someplace to kneel and look at what's before you. So in a way, it's like a, a stage set for the painting or, or a commentary on the painting or both. Uh, then the second work that I've known well is the uh, uh, painting, the dark blue painting that was in the Hirshhorn Museum, or is in the Hirshhorn Museum um, collection. Now this is uh, painted just a few years earlier, but it's like a world of difference in terms of abstraction. It's a, a dark blue atmospheric painting, almost a, uh, like a tumultuous uh, kind of storm with a little bit of light poking through. And, you know, what I love about the occasion to speak on Dreyer is it's giving me a chance to sort of connect these two paintings, to do the intellectual and visual work of thinking through how, in a short amount of time, Dreyer produced such a great variety of work. And um, for those who don't know, Dreyer was born in 1957. She passed away at the age of 34 in 1992. Her first uh, solo exhibition was at the John Good Gallery in New York in 1986. So really these exhibitions at the Phillips and in Reston are um, taking a look at less than 10 years worth of work that comprise um, Dreyer's tragically short career. Now, while I'm not an expert on Dreyer, I have um, spent a significant amount of my career working on under-recognized artists who work in abstraction. And as Sarah said, right now I have uh, an exhibition up at the Baltimore Museum of Art by this artist, Joe Schmale. Uh, I've worked on an, a retrospective project on the work of Marin Hassinger. And quite a while ago, I did a posthumous survey of Anne Truitt's career. And so, you know, I connect to this project on Moira Dreyer because I really appreciate both the research and advocacy that has gone into making this possible. Uh, when one is researching an underrecognized artist, particularly one who's deceased, it's, um, there's quite a, a large amount of detective work that goes into finding information about that artist because there tend not to be huge texts already written on these people. So one must go back um, into the archives and find small mentions, uh, quotations, 
possibly do interviews. There's a lot of piecing together the story and the discourse around the artist's work. You know, by the same token, um, the advocacy needed to get the work uh, and a show of the work of an underknown artist on a museum schedule can be quite significant. Um, museums are institutions that want to bring in audiences, they want to bring in funding, and when you have an underrecognized artist, you don't necessarily have a marquee name that will bring people into an institution. So, you know, I think we're very lucky that um, we have these two dryer exhibitions in the Washington area, and we'll be even luckier when we can go in to see them. You're looking at a view of the show at the Phillips Collection right now. Um, just to kind of continue on that point, you know, there is a lot of rhetoric right now around diversifying um, museums programming, both in terms of race and gender. And one thing that I think we as sort of savvy viewers need to be aware of is that often institutions look to a, a diverse group of artists, certainly, but a small diverse group of artists that have been vetted through commercial galleries and the marketplace and established collectors and collections. So again, I just really want to underscore the importance of of going back into sort of the historical record and giving attention to someone like Dreyer, or for that matter, Truett, but particularly Dreyer, who has a, you know, a relatively small body of work. So there isn't a whole lot of commercial incentive for the market to, uh, or a collector to stand behind Dreyer, um, because there's not gonna be a lot of exchanging back and forth and raise and price, uh, sales made around her work. You know, the other thing that's interesting about Dreyer, and it's true for Ann Truitt as well, is that there's this great innovative physicality of their work. With Truitt, she was combining painting and sculpture. You can see the same tendencies in Dreyer's work. So these are not necessarily objects that are easy to put into the domestic space of a private collection, or even necessarily install in museum galleries. So that's another thing that can um, make it difficult for an artist to sort of both get teeth at the time they're working, but also to sort of insinuate themselves into a historical record after the fact. Um, so again, just kudos to Lily Siegel and also Klaus Ottman, who's in, involved in the Philip show for making these projects happen. But, um, you know, really, I think more than sort of this um, focusing on the under recognition of these artists, I want to connect them and, and take us further into more uh, Dreyer's work by thinking through the way that their approach to abstraction engages with feeling, it engages with the experiences of life, it engages with psychology. All of this I sort of fit under the term affective, that is affective, um, abstraction. And what we'll, we're gonna need to do in the next few slides is talk about sort of this approach to abstraction uh, compared to earlier approaches to abstraction the 20th century to understand why it's so different. And I think it's particularly relevant to do that at this moment when we are questioning the art world and we're questioning art and its place in our society. Because I think and I hope that affective art, art that touches our feelings, art that connects to human experience and addresses it in a, in a pretty open way, um, art that is truly interlaced with life, is a very hopeful um, possibility for uh, art going forward. So just to quickly um, go back to some of the artists I mentioned, um, another commonality to these women's work is that not um, in everything that they make, but in many of the works that they make, there is sort of the use of art to address hardship or to um, kind of persevere and move forward in the face of obstacles and challenges. So with Maren Hassinger and Ann Truitt, 
And again, Marin Hassinger's work are these pink inflated bags that you see on your screen, screen while Anne Truitt's work are a series of columns. Um, they both experienced sexism, certainly in their careers, and Marin experienced racism. They also, you know, this was talking about sort of the physicality and materiality of work that can make it either easy or not easy to collect. And in both of these artists' cases, the, their approach to materials did not necessarily make it easy, or with Marin, who's still working, do not necessarily make it easy to have in a collection. So, you know, they kept making though, and they kept staying true to their vision of art despite this. And happily, Marin is um, getting some re renewed attention and success right now uh, in her 70s. Joe Schmale, whose um, kind of quirky, odd shaped paintings you see at the top of the screen. Um, Joe has continued to use abstraction as a language to deal with such things as leaving her homeland of South Africa uh, as a reaction against apartheid, dealing with a studio fire that destroyed mo like decades worth of her work, and also overcoming the challenges of a stroke that left her unable to speak um, and for a while unable to even you know, make her artwork. And with Dreyer, of course, you know, part of the, the narrative of the short life is that she, um, she had to come to terms with her own illness of cancer that led to her death at age 34, as well as the illness of um, her husband who died just two years into their marriage. So while I don't want to over-determine the work uh, that we're looking at by sort of hanging um, by our biographical tragedies onto it, again, like looking at all this in 2020 and finding a way that people can connect to the language of abstraction. I want to emphasize that I think we can find inspiration in work that, um, that represents creative acts that have been used as a way of engaging with life and the obstacles of life as well as um, its joys. And also, I mean, it's sort of a, you know, maybe it's a, a slightly less in touch point of view, but I do think it's interesting to reflect for a moment that abstraction, um, so art that does not represent our world in a direct way, but rather expresses itself through form and texture and color and all sorts of visual elements, uh, formal visual elements, that, that abstraction can be a robust enough language to offer commentary or to sort of model experiences of life. Okay, so with all that being said, um, let's kind of dive into the more art historical part of this talk um, and really understand kind of the discourse from which Dreyer's work emerged. I'm going to bring Truett back into the conversation um, sort of as a generational counterpoint to, to Dreyer. Now, Andrew was born in 1921, and she developed her artwork in Washington, D.C., uh, alongside friends and fellow artists Kenneth Nolan and Morris Lewis. Truett, Nolan, and Lewis were all um, had close relations. So they were all friendly with Clement Greenberg, who was a very formidable art crit critic who um, played an important role, a really formative role, in articulating an agenda for 20th century abstraction. So Greenberg, along with our artists and other critics and dealers, um, established what I'm going to sort of use, like I'm just gonna use uh, as a shorthand description. They established a modernist lineage for, lineage for abstract art in which color field artists like Nolan and Lewis built upon the uh, legacy of abstract expressionists like Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock, who had in turn built on the legacy of Cubism before that. And in this way of thinking, abstract painting's primary concern was really the formal or, or visual investigation of compositional possibilities specific to, the, to whatever medium they were working in, in this case, the medium of painting. So uh, these artists explored the optical and non-representational effects that could be achieved through moving paint um, on a surface, on a typically a canvas surface. 
That means that representation of our world, storytelling and illusionism were not part of the goals of this painting. And further, it's really important to our discussion of Dreyer, that the, the foregrounding or implication of personal emotion in a painting, uh, the expression of individual psychology or biographical reference, or really any kind of specific associations were not valued um, and not held <laughs> in a very high place when looking at abstraction of this period and of this type. The artist Frank Stella, born a little bit later, represents kind of the next wave of thinking in this lineage. And I have up here along with Stella's work, an example of the sculpture of Donald Judd. So abstract sculpture in, mid in the mid 20th century was um, engaged with its own kinds of concerns, some of them quite different from abstract painting of the time. For instance, the minimalists like Donald Judd were, um, were concerned about sort of removing the artist's hand from the making of an object. So they often used industrial fabrication to produce work. And they really wanted to emphasize like the relationship of the sculpture to human bodies and space. But that being said, what they do, I think they do share with um, the modernists and the color field painters was also this sort of rigorous interest in stripping art of personal biography graphical uh, associations and references. So I think it's fair to say that we can describe the discourse around color field and minimalism as deprioritizing emotionality and personalization instead insisting on the idea that a successful artwork kind of existed as an, a separate ent entity, um, a separate entity that was kind of apart from the person that made it. And um, this, this idea is usually talked about as sort of the autonomy of the artwork. It sort of stands alone without a lot of explanation of how and who made it. So to interpret for these, these artists and their um, proponents to interpret an artwork from the lens of the personal was really to sort of question its power and authority. It was to weaken it. And I think we could even go far, farther and say that it was to feminize it in some sense. All right. So <laughs> um, I, th I think just to step back and, and explain another term that I'm using, when I use the word discourse, uh, like a modernist discourse or a minimalist discourse, I'm using it to emphasize that there is a whole network of commentary, analysis, opinion, larger cultural issues and economic relationships that develop around art objects. And that this whole network of ideas and language and um, values can act as a filter, which in turn sort of bring certain artists to the surface and that's why we know them historically and it it means that other artists are kind of lost to history and not so well known and that was certainly ca the case with Anne Truitt. Um, here gender acts as a filter, race can act as a filter, marketability can act as a filter, and sort of critical philosophies can act as filters. These filters then can be compounded by the circumstances of an artist. So for instance, in the case of Anne Truitt, her working from Washington rather than New York would sort of reinforce her not filtering up. And I think in the case of Moira Dreyer, having a short career also um, is part of the, the filter that makes her less known than she deserves to be. But here we are now in 2020, and both sort of mid-century abstraction and dryer are historical, right? They're not really of our times. So as we are diving back into art history, trying to find meaning for today, um, you know, I would argue that the discourse around art in general and the discourse around abstraction has shifted or expanded. And right now in these times, a work's claim um, to be disconnected from its maker's life and from a person's psychology don't really enhance its relevance to us necessarily. 
you know, at a time when we're reckoning with the many ways that bias and power hierarchies determined by race, gender, sexual orientation, and economic circumstances have consciously and unconsciously shaped our world and its systems and institutions. The denial of specificity, the suppression of sort of the human origins of an artwork and its connections to the human experience might in fact make artworks and their makers and their proponents seem obfuscating or even op oppressive. So just to be clear, you know, I, I want to make sure, sure I say that I am fascinated still by Judd's art and I'm deeply attracted to the aesthetics of minimalism. Um, so as we look at these comparisons, you know, I'm not being critical of Judd's uh, output per se. And we can see just in these two slides how his aesthetics or minimalist aesthetics impacted Dreyer in a positive and formative way. But the important lesson that at least I'm reflecting on and I offer it to you all uh, too to think about is that right now we're questioning dominant discourses. And we're questioning dominant discourses, especially when they claim to be free of personal bias or inflection. So like in 2020, I think we, we've come to understand that not, nothing, no one, nobody occupies a neutral position. So if there's any sort of sense of the, the autonomy and sort of that sense of neutrality around the autonomy of an object in mid-century abstraction is something um, that we need to pry open. And in that space, I think we really need to, to celebrate an artist like Dreyer, who has like embraced um, the humanity of her work and the perspective and point of view of her work from the get-go. Um, all right, so let me just close the loop here on, on Truett because I did bring her up as a, a generational counterpoint. So remember, she was born about 100 years ago and she was certainly influenced by those modernists around her um, and not insignificantly, I mean, this can be a subject for another talk, but not insignificantly, those people around her were all male. And therefore she, you know, these, this group of people, including Truett, were very wedded to the importance of formalism. So in Truett's own writings, um, we often see her kind of sublimate personal reference and emphasize that her works are really explorations of color in three dimensions. Um, if you want to kind of dig into the personal reference of these works, you can do some detective work around the titles, or, or you can really just focus on something that's there um, all of us to perceive which is the, the colors that she's using. Unlike the minimalist, she's not using uh, primary colors and again not like other minimalists, um, she is painting on those colors by hand rather than having a, a sculpture machine fabricated. So while we might never um, just looking at these works get to the the precise personal reference or autobiographical incident or whatever that led Truett to make them. The, um, the beauty and the sort of subtlety and the nuance of the color hopefully may cause us to uh, bring forward associations and emotions and sort of psychological feelings um, from our own experience as we relate to the objects that we're seeing. So for me, this is uh, all to say that I see Truett as a very important uh, figure in the evolution of, again, what I'm calling effective abstraction. Now, here we're looking at the galleries at, uh, the rest, at, in Reston, and um, we're looking at the product of an artist who was born 30 years after Anne Truett. And we're finding someone who is not reticent about including personal experience and emotionality in her work. I'd say that Dreyer um, has shed much of the weight of modernism from her outlook and her practice. So along with embracing emotion and autobiography, you can also see that uh, Dreyer has ditched the modernist concern with developing an iconic, clearly recognizable style. And just look at this this image there are many different types of painting in it and you know we started out the talk looking at two very different paintings now 
just to kind of like go back to a thread that I'm weaving through this talk, um, there is a consequence for that, right? I mean, an iconic style is like a brand and a brand sort of helps one's work rise to public consciousness and also um, to sort of gaining a kind of economic stature. So certainly uh, Dreyer's fluidity of style doesn't play into to the kind of that part of the art world. But it's very intentional, um, you know, both at the Phillips collection and the Reston show, there you'll find these wonderful vitrines filled with Dreyer's notes on her work. Um, and in one of them, she writes that uh, she takes a, an approach of visual anarchy to what I'll call uh, her style. So this is the sense that one style is not better than another and that they can coexist within her work. Um, it's, it's a refreshing outlook and it's one again that I think is very apropos to our moment because it's, an, it's a way of you know, continuing to question, continuing to learn, it's rule breaking, um, it challenges the order of, of expectations and also history and it, it sort of represents a fluidity of identity. All of these qualities, I think, are very important to us right now. Now here, here's, you can see the, the glare of my flash. Um, so this is one of my photos, but it's an image of some of Dreyer's notes. And I show it just to, to see that you can, in her own words, she's not just embracing emotionality, but she sees it as a primary content of her work. And this is sort of reinforced in a quote um, of Dreyer's that was published in Art in America in 1987, which I'm gonna go ahead and read because um, I think it's very important uh, sort of example of Dreyer tying in uh, the emotionality of her work along with sort of her desire to work in many different styles. So she says, there was a point a few years ago when people started to hate painting again. It was supposed to be an antiquated language. Actually, that was just when things began to loosen up. You could finally make abstract paintings which aren't all angst, paintings full of different kinds of information. For example, you could have a conceptual background and also be involved with expressionistic issues. That was and is a new territory. It can mean, for example, big abstract paintings that are not egocentric or fully achieved paintings that refer to other work. It can mean parodies or expressive recombinations of established vocabularies. I think this is exciting. For example, a few years ago, I started to make target and stripe paintings, but I wasn't addressing the same issues as the original users of those elements. Instead, it was like having a dictionary in front of me. I could refer refer to these established languages for my own ends, be they critical or emotional. I can, I, I like feel Dreyer's excitement in her words. It's as if she's feeling very liberated. And, you know, from her outlook, abstract painting is less of a discipline, again, kind of a modernist idea um, in which certain approaches are deemed correct and successful. And rather it's, it's a rich and dynamic, we could say vehicle or language for exploration and expression. You know, I, I think it's also so worth noting that there's a sort of a positive spirit in this quote. It's not as if she is um, overtly critiquing uh, what came in the past, just kind of pulling it for her own use. And uh, if you'll indulge me in reading one more quote, um, which I don't have a slide of, but I think it's worth sharing. Rob Storr, uh, an amazing curator, provided a really elucidating description of um, the distinctions of Dreyer's practice on these topics in a 1993 essay he wrote for a posthumous MoMA show of her work. I'm gonna quote it at length because it shows an appreciation of Dreyer at the time she was working, and it also reflects the terminology or discourse of contemporary art in the early 1990s. So he writes, the point of Dreyer's sly quotations of canonical modernism, meanwhile, were not to outsmart the masters, not to assume the role of star people to postmodernist theoreticians. At a time in the late 1980s, 
when alternately disrespectful and academically overly respectful forms of appropriation had finally fixed upon abstraction. Dreyer's head and heart were elsewhere. Irony, a primary and avowed element in her work, was the artist's means of eliciting complex reactions to hybrid painting rather than a weapon for coercing predictable responsibles to art and ideology. So I think that Storr is getting at the freshness and the humanity and sort of the fluidity of Dreyer's approach and his observations. All right, so now I, I thought it would be interesting to kind of turn to a, a sort of an exercise in reading abstraction. This gets to the point that I wanna make that, you know, abstract strategies are diverse. And, um, you know, even though it seems like the sort of building blocks of abstraction are simple and straightforward, they can be put together in ways that that sort of convey a whole range of meanings and they can belong to a modernist like Kenneth Nolan and to someone who's rethinking modernism like Moira Dreyer and you be used to different ends. So here you have two, we'll call them target like paintings. Um, you know, I just should say that we could also put a Jasper Johns target painting up here too and we would expand the conversation in a direction that we don't have time for tonight but it's another uh, interesting way to think about Dreyer's work uh, is in its relationship to Jasper Johns but I just want to for us to observe the different physicality of these two um, works of art. Dreyer is using different kinds of material. She's using paper which she's then cut and um, you know, kind of pulled off of its surface to show us its its physicality in space. It has a very um, somewhat handmade quality to it and even a little bit of a fragile quality, but it's all very tactile and physical. I'm moving my fingers as I'm talking about it because I can imagine touching that that piece and having a real visceral response to it. Nolan, on the other hand, is working in a way where he's He's putting paint onto unprimed canvas so that the paint actually soaks into the canvas and becomes one layer of, of image, um, canvas and paint. So, you know, where Dreyer has this sort of tactility and depth, Nolan emphasizes a flatness and just sort of the pure experience of color on a plane. The color is interesting too, you know, Nolan's, yellows and blues don't necessarily have a specific, they don't conjure a specific association, although they may feel kind of tied to the times in which he's working. So that yellow might feel like a 1960s yellow, but doesn't feel like a specific thing where, you know, we can start kind of playing a game of associations with what Dreyer is doing. I mean, in some ways it feels like a very yolky, egg yolk type of yellow. Um, perhaps a flower yellow or sunburst. And then when we kind of take the color out of the equation, there's this almost reads as an eye with eyelashes around it. So there's all kind of so ways we can relate to um, Dreyer's work, and they all have to do with this, this sort of experience of the everyday in our lives. So for Noland, I'd say his abstraction is very ethereal. And with Dreyer, we have a much more embodied uh, kind of abstraction. You can do the same work with these two paintings, uh, a work by Morris Lewis, Tet, and Moira Dreyer's Suburbia. They're both sort of on the surface, paintings about veils of blue paint. Lewis, working like Nolan, is pouring paint, in this case, onto unprimed canvas. So it stains, and it, it, it you know, his technique is really, um, quite amazing and there's sort of a mystery to Hall, I think, this painting. Like how did that paint get onto the surface? Did it even pass through human hands? Because you don't, you don't see any brushwork um, and you don't necessarily see evidence of application. And it's all, again all very flat. With Dreyer's piece, uh, first of all, it's not on canvas, it's on wood, which has its own type of physicality. She's using some uh, a material called casein, which is a, a paint, a very ancient type of paint um, that involves milk protein. It dries very quickly, but it does allow her to get these sort of daily washes on her surfaces. 
And then over the, the um, washes of blue, she's, she's kind of painted or um, drawn with a brush, a contour. So instead of the flatness of Lewis's painting, you get a very um, tactile and layered kind of experience of texture and paint with uh, the dryer work. Now I'm gonna show you again, using my own image, this great detail of Dreyer's piece. She's appended a garage door handle to her work and of course titled that work Suburbia. Um, I have to indulge in this. It's, I'm not making any claims <laughs> that Dreyer was thinking of Morris Lewis and the way that Morris Lewis made paintings when she made this work. But just to, again, to play a game, uh, the way that more, or the place that Morris Lewis made his paintings was in fact suburban Washington, DC. And he used a relatively small um, room in his house, his dining room, to make these massive canvases, again, that almost look like no human hand touched them. They, should have, they have no evidence of place or location. Um, they're quote unquote universal, which I put in quotes because it's a term we have to be careful using. But um, just to use the modernist terminology, they're universal, they're timeless, and they're unhinged from any specificity of the person that made them or the place in which they made. Dreyer, on the other hand, sort of clashes her blue or collides this uh, blue veiled abstraction with something that's completely banal and physical and recognizable and tactile and a signature of suburbia. So where Lewis's was actually made in the suburban setting, we have no evidence of it. Dreyer's, which was made in New York, is um, sort of singing, <laughs> singing every part of it about suburbia. Um, and I think it's, you know, this is just a fun way to think through the differences of these two blue abstract paintings, right? All right, and again, um, just another juxtaposition to show the differences. We're closing the generational gap. Frank Stella is closer in age to Dreyer than the other artists I've mentioned. But you can still see, despite the fact we have round paintings with bright colors, there really is a difference in personality. In fact, with the metal sort of spikes that um, come out of Dreyer's piece, you know, one can use words like there's a certain fierceness in it. Um, there's kind of a sort of a showiness and aggress aggression. I'm, I keep using words that are associated with human behaviors and feelings. And so I can, I can think I can say that I anthropomorphize the work. I mean, I'm very drawn to sort of giving it human qualities where that's not as easy an exercise to do with Stella's, which does seem to be more about just seeing color and form. Um, so, you know, just different approaches to abstraction, one pushing us more towards the experience of tying abstraction to human qualities. And um, you know, here you can see again some of Dreyer's own language and descriptions about what painting does. Uh, she says it addresses the psyche, it's a realm to think about things and to understand things that might otherwise be mysterious, and acknowledging a kind of world both of ruin or promise. So rather than trying to transcend the world in which she's living or herself as a human, the painting allows her to access it more profoundly. And this again is what I'm thinking of as affective abstraction. So for my last um, few comments, I just wanna run through a series of self portraits that you would see if you visited the Phillips collection. Um, Dreyer exhibition. And just first of all, make note that Dreyer is using abstraction as a, a, a tool for self portraiture, but she's also doing it in a highly inventive way that changes over the course of the paintings that we're going to look at um, four paintings that span just three years in her career. So here, we know it's a self-portrait um, because she titles it conveniently self-portrait, but also because again, she's anthropomorphizing the imagery. So if we sort of stripped out a lot of the details of this image, we'd be left with a green rectangle on a reddish brown background and kind of be sort of in the place of a, a rather heavily painted um, color field painting. 
you know, not only would it uh, recall some of the artists that we've looked at, but another um, artist we should mention who was very, uh, who had a very high standing in the 1980s when this painting was made is Gerhard Richter, who um, really has two bodies of the work, but the one I'm thinking of are his paintings made with squeegees that create sort of big fields of vibrant color but um, don't really cult cultivate emotionality or human connection uh, between the painting and the, that person looking at it. So here, Dreyer takes the sort of fundamentals of um, a field painting and she tweaks them all over the place. She, you know, adds these black curly cues, which don't just signify hair, they signify a particular kind of hair, sort of a, you know, they're not a severe haircut, there's kind of a, a um, a pretty hairstyle, if you will. And then she has the screen rectangle inserted into this circular gray form, rectangular uh, rectangle with a circular oval form cut within it that functions in a way as a collar of some type of clothing. What it's also doing that um, is sort of pushing modernist conventions is it's creating a sense of space. So not only do we have like this sort of anthropomorphic form, the way the form is being um, represented on the, on the field of the uh, piece of wood in this case, with that shadowy um, rectangular form at the side is giving us a sense of almost narrative type space in the painting. We can see what's in the foreground, the middle ground and the background. Um, so this is something that's also really refreshing in the way that uh, Dreyer approaches abstraction. And of course, it's, you know, it's not without significance that these two rectangular forms with slits in them are quite feminine, I would say, as forms. And so with this work, it's not just about it being a self-portrait, it's, it's a gendered painting. It's an openly gendered painting. It's like proudly feminine. <laughs> Um, and I, I feel again, like just for me, it's exciting to see abstraction being used this way. Um, and one of the things, you know, in reflecting on this work that I, I feel like would be a very interesting exercise is to kind of look across abstract painting at the 1980s and look to see where else um, women artists specifically are using the language of abstraction to create something that has such a feminine quality. I'm not really thinking of sort of floral imagery um, that's conflated with the, the female anatomy sort of in the vein of um, Georgia O'Keeffe, but really what Dreyer is doing, she's taking shape and she's thinking about it in a very in innovative way, um, inserting space into the painting, inserting sort of the figure into abstraction, and giving us uh, something that we relate to um, from our own experience of gender um, and identity. So the next um, painting that I'm kind of lumping into this se sequence of self-portraits or pa paintings you know, by Dreyer, about Dreyer, is a work from 1987 called The Signature Painting. It's a work um, I just find really fascinating. And it too is playing with space, right? So just through the device of concentric rectangles executed in sort of contrasting colors, we create, we see something that isn't necessarily flat the longer that we look at it. It might be, um, to some people, you can start to see those uh, rectangles receding in space. For other people, they might start emerging like a weird wavy pyramid coming towards them from the canvas. But there is, um, there is sort of a play between abstraction and illusionism in, in this work, which again is so contrary to what um, modernist abstractionists were doing. And of of course, you know, sitting there right on top of the surface is sort of an absolute no-no in um, kind of the world of pristine autonomous painting. It's, she places her initials right on the front of the, of the painting and reiterates the D in the lower panel. Um, I have a close-up if you want to just take a quick look there. 
So what is so, um, again, playful and interesting and humanizing about this work is when we think about it, the trajectory of modernist abstraction and this idea that there is for um, these modernists an iconic, easily recognizable style, the style itself becomes a signature, even though, um, what do I say, a signature or a brand, uh, even though we don't really know the personal details of the artist. Here, there's a kind of flamboyant, again, rather feminine um, execution of the M and the D to totally claim this as Moira Dreyer's and to do so amongst a group of work that doesn't necessarily cohere into an iconic style. Now, as you look at the lower panel, and again, here she's breaking another rule in, in terms of sort of adding a sculptural element to um, a, a, just a regular old painting to increase its theatricality, to sort of increase its relationship to our body. This panel looks a lot like the one we saw in the, the first painting I showed you, DD from 1990. It has that um, kind of quality of a, an altar or a place to kneel and to consider the painting in front of it. Um, if you look at the D on the lower panel, it's been elongated into something that looks like an infinity sign. And to me, this is kind of the interesting, the most interesting content of this painting. So we have an artist who's cl claiming the work right on the surface as her own, and she's stretching her name into an infinity symbol. It seems to be kind of questioning the longevity of her painting, um, the enduring qualities, uh, like putting the question out there, you know, will this painting endure? Will I as an artist endure? And that really, um, again, gets to the heart of some of the things we're talking about, which is, you know, is this, this, this question of a distinction, like from 20, in 2020, you know, what do we feel is the more enduring of these two approaches to abstraction? That which sort of doesn't, um, where it's hard on its sleeve, it doesn't sort of put the maker and the experiences of the maker forward. It relies on something very recognizable and autonomous as a style. Um, so the modernist school, or this very personality driven artwork of Moira Dreyer's that has affect all the, over the place um, and really puts her and centers her uh, in its work. And you know, I guess a corollary of that question, which I, I feel like I have to ask, is um, in the time, so right now, in the time that, in our times with artists who are making work now and people who are responding to that work now, like, does it matter, does it still even matter to us that painting endures and endures and endures and endures? This is really a question about like, is art about the times in which it is made, or is it, does it sit sort of removed um, from circumstance and try to kind of transcend everything and speak to everyone for all time? Um, I have no answers for that tonight, but I do just put it out there to think about. All right, so lastly, I would like to um, talk about these two paintings, both from 1988 the um, green blue painting uh, that's kind of hanging to the side of, of this image is EKG and in front of us is a sort of orange green painting called fingerprint number 2647. Um, you know even so if, if we didn't have the titles kind of giving specific references to these work uh, you know, they're still something very different in quality. They, they rely on concentric form, right? Um, not unlike the signature painting. But here, there's a very different kind of personality and quality to those concentric lines, which is just interesting and something to note. And, you know, that difference, I think, comes from the fact that these are not just representations of the body, the fingerprint, and um, 
the EKG, so the movement of, our, of a person's heart, in this case, dryers, but they are executed by a body. So the personality of, of the person making the, the gesture of paint here, so dryers gesture, comes through in the way that these concentric lines show irregularities, in addition, of course, to the initial source image. So what I, I just had to put this one um, comparison up, again, a painting from a similar point in time, but made by a, uh, a much older artist. You know, Dreyer is not the only artist at this time who's, who's putting forward abstractions of things that are actual things, actual objects in the real world. Andy Warhol is doing it uh, with his camouflage paintings. You have something that's abstract, but it has a function or an existence in the real world. I think Warhol's oxidation paintings are also kind of relevant to these works. The oxidation paintings were made when uh, Warhol had people to his, to his studio and asked them to urinate on canvases that were coated with copper paint. So the end result is an abstraction, but the image itself is, um, is made by the body. So, you know, despite Rob Storr's observation that Dreyer is an artist who engages with irony, I really don't think that in the case of these works in particular, that um, she's tackling this sort of relationship between abstraction and ag actuality in the kind of irreverent pop way that Andy Warhol is. And that's, a, that's important, you know, that's a distinguishing kind of poignancy to Dreyer's work that pulls it out of the, uh, the realm of appropriation art and turns it into something else, um, something that's more uh, intimate and personal. So here, again, also, if you think through this trajectory, this, this little short sort of microcosm of, of um, portraiture in Dreyer's art, you know, we've started kind of with the outward facing abstract form with a hairstyle and clothes and sort of dressed and presented um, to us, moved to a, a, the signature painting, which is also something that very much puts forward something that's public, uh, the artist's signature as the content of the painting. But here we're moving into a much more intimate terrain, something that's very small, although rendered at a large scale and something very, very personal. Um, and that I feel like makes these two uh, paintings very special and very moving, especially if we kind of frame them um, with Dreyer's biography and knowing that her health is an issue, the work EKG in particular sort of suggests the monitoring um, and the fragility of that health. Now, another thing that's really amazing in these works is that although they are very specific to Dreyer because they're her fingerprint and her EKG print, um, she's chosen these, we'll call them signs of humanity that we all have. I mean, we're all leaving our fingerprints everywhere every day, um, this intimate touch on things that are close to us. And we all know the experience of our heart beating um, and you know, what it would mean to have to have that checked and monitored. So these abstractions um, are really, again, very remarkable to me. And they operate so much in the realm of affect because she's managing to sort of not just represent an image of her body, but in the act of painting, make those paintings even more a reflection of her physicality at a moment of time and her thinking at a moment of time. But simultaneously, the subject reaches out to each of us and our own individual experiences. So there's great humanity in these paintings. And um, I think that's really the, the note that I want to end on that, you know, Dreyer presents for us this example of abstraction, a language that, um, you know, over the last hundred years has often been sort of pushed towards this um, 
you know, I, I think I can say maybe not completely true notions of being so um, autonomous and universal and transcendent. And instead, she gives us an abstraction that's very specific and very intimate and very personal. But it's really that strategy of making it specific and personal and intimate that makes it more, um, more attractive and more possible for, for people, just everyday humans, to sort of interact with it and relate to it and um, bring their own experiences to it. And so in that sense, maybe it is actually the more universal of the two approaches. So thank you so much. Um, and I hope everyone gets to see both exhibitions. Kristen, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and experiences with us about Dreyer's work and, um, and, and comparing other artists like Anne Truitt, where, who share similar qualities and stories um, within their, within their oeuvre that, that was really an informative and interesting presentation. Um, you spoke a lot about how Dreyer incorporates this quality of living in her work and juxtaposed her style with how, for example, color field and minimalist works sometimes remove that person or that personal emotion. And I was particularly happy that you emphasized how abstraction, um, like figurative work, is robust enough on its own to also depict life and experiences. And really enjoyed the term you used of her work being proudly feminine. Um, and you're right, the research and advocacy in this body of work is so strong. And the effort in this exhibit is, is incredible, and especially for someone that is deceased and underrepresented. So I certainly want to give gratitude and praise to Lily Siegel and her strength and dedication for um, you know, holding strong on sharing this work with us. I know it was it took many years to get to this point. So that is certainly really commendable. So a few questions um, before we end tonight's program. I was really glad that you mentioned dominant discourses. Uh, you explained that that term, you explained that term and concept and how so many artists are overlooked. You mentioned that we as a society need to do a better job at celebrating artists like Dreyer at the very beginning. Um, and I was curious whether you have any thoughts on whether that will continue to be the case or whether the art world will potentially evolve to more widely be able to embrace and recognize artists. Well, that is a huge <laughs> and very important <laughs> question. Um, you know, especially at a moment when everything feels so uncertain it's it's difficult to to actually give you um an answer i wish i had i wish i had a clear vision ahead of what would happen but uh, you know i can just i can say this um right now the art world is fairly monolithic right i i tried to make the point that even at times when diversity is introduced into sort of institutions. It's diversity that has already been packaged. It's a horrible way to say it, but packaged by established um, really commercial interests, right? So there is a relationship between museums and commercial galleries. And the more powerful a commercial gallery, the more likelihood that that gallery will get its um, members of its roster or its stable of artists into museum exhibitions. And this is because it's those are the artists that collectors are collecting and those collectors sit on museum boards and um, there's a there's a whole lot of again discursive reasons why that is a fairly closed system. Now what I do think is really interesting and, and why an institution like Reston sort of offers another path and a really important one is that um, smaller institu institutions like 
I feel a little, it's a little mean to call you an institution because <laughs> I want to emphasize the nimbleness um, and sort of the grassroots sort of nature of a place like the Greater Reston Art Center. Like the closer that we get to the un, like the less known communities of artists, the more we can bring more artists into um, situations where their works get shown to publics that might um, find value in them. So in a way, like the end of that, to, end, to summarize and some kind of answer to your question, it's just that my hope is that, you know, even if like the, the blue chip art world continues to exist, that for new audiences, like it really is about like audiences and may, and showing things that are relevant to people's lives so that they care about just the practice of art. And, um, you know, my hope is that like, there will be lots of audiences and they can support smaller institutions who are doing this kind of work of bringing a much broader uh, cross section of artists up to the surface. And, you know, if eventually some of those art artists filter all the way up and they make millions of dollars off their paintings, or sculptures or whatever, well, great. But for me, the relationships that are most important are those where like a person gets to see something made by another person and ha has a meaningful experience around it. Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I know that was a big question. <laughs> Um, but you're right. I mean, the blue chip galleries obviously are, are, you know, what we always see as leading the art world, but there's such importance in, in these smaller organizations like Greater Reston Art Center who also have an impact in just being able to simply share that work with communities and have at least one to a hundred people be able to be touched um, you know, emotionally or spiritually or whatever it is by, by the work. Um, so my last question, and this is, I guess this is, this may be a layer to that question, but you mentioned care, um, when you were kind of describing, um, you know, whether it will continue to be the case that the art world or how the art world embraces more widely embraces and recognizes artists. But during your presentation, you spoke about affective or affective work, not effective and how that work addresses our feelings and is really particular meaningful and hopeful for this time right now. And, you know, Dreyer broke so many boundaries with her version of an abstract work. And with that said, um, I guess this is a second tier to the first question, but what type of influences do you think could inform um, how personality driven work like dryers could potentially be even more enduring during this time well i mean so you know again the key is like the key is sort of methods of distribution right um and well actually let me uh, there's one other thing i think i that maybe um tangentially sort of addresses this question you know I have worked nearly 25 years as a curator, and I can say that like the the greatest pleasure that I have have had in my work is one getting to know artists, the artists who make the work, mm -hmm. and two getting to sort of stand in front of an object and have a conversation with like someone who comes through a museum on a first Friday gallery tour, right? So that's the human part of it. I mean, the objects are great, you know, they're um, inspiring, they're wonderful, they can like just blow your mind and your eyes and everything. But one can't underestimate the human quality, right? And so I think, um, you know, I think it's a, like communication has everything to do with it. You know, I get back to like the importance of an organization. That's the better term, organization rather than institution, like um, the Greater Rest and Art Center. You know, it's uh, relationships and communities can sort of spring up around an organization like Grace. Um, and 
through those people to people contact, you, you talk about art and you develop a new discourse and you put forward new artists. And, um, I, you know, I, I tend to have found that artists who, you know, address feeling and dress affect and um, have high affect work and dress sort of the experience of being human are the ones where you can make that that sort of strongest connection perhaps to an audience that doesn't necessarily have a background in the language and vocabulary of art. And this is specifically like really pertinent to abstraction because abstraction can be a very difficult language to access, right? So it's all about how we and our profession communicate about artists and how, you know, just seriously, we hold our relationships to the communities in which we operate and really kind of have that special, the special experience that we have interacting with artists, we need to sort of bring that. So, you know, whether it's sort of creating direct conversations between artists and audiences or doing a really great job of translating the humanity in it all, I think is essential to this equation of, of making art relevant. I completely agree. Um, well, you're, you mentioned that we're lucky, lucky to have Dreyer's work in this region, and I am 100% on the same page, and we hope to all see it again very soon. So thank you again, Kristen, for joining us this evening and sharing your presentation and your thoughts and insights and experiences with work like Dreyer. Um, uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Just to reiterate, the online viewing room of Maura Dreyer's exhibition, Yours for the Asking, can be found on our website at restinarts.org. Please feel free to leave additional comments and questions for Kristen on our Instagram, which is at restinarts, or by emailing us at info at restinarts.org. You can connect with us on social media and sign up for our newsletter through that email to stay updated on all things Greater Western Art Center. Once again, thank you everyone for joining. <laughs>